Buongiorno. Good morning. Welcome to this Tuscan experience. Let's open our window on this very beautiful countryside that you were watching a few moments ago. We are in Masseto in Chianti. This is a borgo. It's a small village in the countryside at the center of Tuscan, in the heart of this region. This is the region which corresponds to the heart of Italy, approximately. It is facing the Mediterranean Sea. It has a beautiful coastal area, but at the heart of the region, there is the most important city of Tuscany, which is Firenze, Florence. And we are exactly south of Florence, between Florence and Siena. There were the two main rival towns back in the medieval centuries, in the 1100s, 1200s. These were the two cities that were competing for power here in this beautiful land that was originally inhabited by the Etruscans that were the forerunners of the Romans. We are talking about, you know, something that goes back in time to 3,000 years ago. Here, in this beautiful place, we are going to meet the family who's been taking care of the place for generations. We are going to meet here artists, artisans, art historians and tour guides and singers. We'll meet a great chef also who is going to teach us how to prepare very tasty traditional meal. So be ready for the experience. I trust you will enjoy it. Let's go inside and let's meet our friends. Andiamo. So let's go inside and let's meet our friends here waiting for us. Leonardo is here. Leonardo Buongiorno. is the tour leader and tour guide. My dear friend who introduced me to this beautiful family who has been taking care Hi. of this place for generations. Good morning. This is Paola, Paola, Giovanna. Paola Giovanna. Yes, good morning. Good morning. And Giacomo. Filippo and Federica are the, the son and daughter of and daughter. Paola Giovanna. Yes. Two of them. Four two, two of your four children. Thank you for having us here. It's a it's pleasure. A, yes, it's a pleasure yeah. for us. So what what can you tell us about this place and your family? Uh, this place is, a, for me, is a, a beautiful place, but I believe for everybody because we are in the middle of the county and county is a blessed uh, region. region. Yes. yes. This house is uh, my family from 300 years, mm -hmm. and I am the now in the moment the owner, but they follow me. Is mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, a historical building, yes, because you can enter, please. Mm -hmm. I show you. This is a tower, yes, a watch tower. A watchtower from which from century? 11th century. 11th century. Yes. So, and a thousand years ago. Thousand years ago. <laughs> and this tower was a stop between the two republics of Florence and Siena that you know they fought for centuries for the supremacy in Tuscany. Yes. And this three, one down, one near, and one up in the hood are three towers, the war tower controlling the arrival of the enemies. Mm -hmm. Because here was Florentine territory. A front south could arrive only to the, from that part, the Senesi. The people from the Siena, people from yeah, Siena. the historical yeah, rival yes. and enemy of Florence, yeah. And uh, till 1555, the, the, the tower was military building. Mm -hmm. After 55, 1555, when Florence won, uh, 
they got useless and changed use as normal and civil houses. And we have from not from that moment, from, but a little bit later, mm -hmm. the, the property of the, this part of beautiful county. And of course, here in this Tuscan experience, food will be the main ingredient when it comes to our stomach and our taste. And we are about to meet our great chef that is going to teach us uh, very tasty recipes, traditional ones uh, related to Tuscany. So let me introduce to you Silvia, our oh, great hello. chef. Ciao, buongiorno. Welcome to my <laughs> Thank kitchen. Thank you, yes. Let's go inside. Let's go. So we are here in the kitchen with Silvia Maccari, our great expert. Uh, she has uh, an incredible story to tell us about, you know, her background. She's been one of the very first ones. In Florence, I started in 1997. Wow. There were only three people giving cooking classes. The first one was Cordon Bleu, of course, mm -hmm. the school. And there was one of the teachers. Then there was a, an American lady. And then there was me. Wow. And since then, I've been on the market. Mm -hmm. Which is, to me, something important because, you know, business goes, opens, closes, but I've always been on the market. So maybe people were happy with my teaching, the way I'm teaching and the recipes I'm showing them. Uh, today we are going to start with uh, the dough for the focaccia. Great, right? which is it's, something very traditional here in Tuscany. It's, very, it's a staple recipe. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need lots of ingredients. You only need to know how to make it. Mm -hmm. You need plain flour. You need yeast here, some lukewarm water, and olive oil. Now here, I was bringing three different samples. I'm not going to tell you about the producers. Yes, be a because you should know that Sylvia is an expert in extra virgin olive oil, exactly. which is one of our exactly. great products here in Tuscany. But She's really an expert. We are going to talk about yeah. olive oil yeah, in a we separate will. section. Sure. So here we are, yeast. Mm -hmm. The right quantity goes into lukewarm water and you just dissolve it. Now you have to know that to activate the leavening factors of the yeast, you need to feed the yeast. Mm. Like you do in, in wine. Mm. You have to develop sugar. Yes. It's exactly the same. If you need a fermentation in wine, you need the sugars to turn into alcohol. Mm -hmm. The same happens here. Of course, we feed our yeast with a small quantity of sugar so that theoretically, if you leave it in the water, it will start throwing bubbles, which means the yeast is working. And you don't use salt at the very beginning mm -hmm. because the salt is stopping the living process. And you start incorporating the water with the yeast. And to make it nicer, we are going to use olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil. In Tuscan, we only produce <laughs> extra virgin olive oil. And two tablespoons. Now you have to work the dough with your hands. This is the right movement. You incorporate the dry flour into the humid dough. And you still check the consistency. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how much water you are mm -hmm. going to need. 
because this depends right. on the weather. Yes. If it is very dry, like today, mm -hmm. you, won't, you will need a little bit more. If you are making the same dough in the winter, you will need less. So you always have a little bit of water mm -hmm. to the side. Yes. And you can always feel All right. if it is too dry or yeah. if you need some more. All right. This is the movement to work the dough out. You see, it is a very elastic dough. And while you are working the dough in this way, you are activating the gluten, which is inside the flour. Mm -hmm. And the gluten is what makes the dough elastic. But you need to be a little bit more aggressive. So it's a very good operation if yes. you are stressed or if you are angry at someone, because <laughs> at this point, you start to do this. All right. Okay. Here we are. That's the first part. A little bit of olive oil on top because you don't want the dough to build a film okay. to dry up. All right. And so, so is there a way to understand what is the right softness? Uh, the yes. Table? Look, yes. this is what you do. You use your fingers. Okay. In the kitchen, you always use your hands. Yes. You're never scared. You cover. Yes. And you place it in a protected space, which okay. could be our oven is not on. Mm -hmm. It's just to prevent the dough to get air. Yes. Because otherwise it won't rise. So we will check it again in one hour. Okay. And you will see how it is being growing. This will be the second part of the process. Great. Okay. Thank you. Grazie. Ciao. Ciao. And here we are now with one of our great artisans, Veronica Valsani. She's an, an art restorer. And she is a very talented one. And she specialized in uh, creating very beautiful miniatures the way they were done centuries ago back in the medieval times buongiorno veronica ciao buongiorno. so what are you showing us here cosa facciamo dipingendo a tempera al rosso d'uovo so we are painting with the uh, york, york. And pigments. Of the egg and pigments. So I'm just showing you what Veronica is creating, all the different steps of her process. La foglia d'oro l'hai applicata in precedenza, giusto? Sì, sì, applico la foglia di oro zecchino su carta. So that's a gold leaf that has been applied on paper. E poi dipingo con la tempera grassa, la tempera rosso d'uovo direttamente sulla lamina metallica. And then Veronica paints directly on the gold leaf uh, with the tempera. ask something maybe. Veronica, quanto tempo hai impiegato per imparare questa tecnica? How long did it take you to learn this craft? Allora, io ho studiato una formazione da restauratore di opere d'arte, perciò ehm, già durante la, fre la frequentazione della scuola di restauro eh, basilare la conoscenza delle tecniche antiche. 
e all'inizio era una passione poi pian piano è diventato anche un lavoro che è parallelo alla mia attività di restauratore. Well, uh, to cut it short, it started as a passion and then became Veronica's uh, job. Uh, basically, at the very beginning, when she started studying at the um, school in Florence, where she learned uh, restoration, and which goes along with the ancient uh, painting techniques. As we keep enjoying this amazing countryside we have here around us in this Chianti region you see right ahead those olive trees and vineyards we are going to discover something that is really unique and Amazing. You are meeting here Leonardo Scarpelli, which is who's one of the greatest talented artists that I know. And what you're going to discover here together with Leonardo and Katia, who's Leonardo's sister. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Ciao you're going to discover one of the ancient arts that uh, are still continued nowadays. These arts were started back in the 1500s, right? In the Renaissance, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With the Medici family. With the Medici family, who wanted to start something, an artwork that will last for a long time without needing any specific, you know, uh, restoration process eventually yeah. along the years. So what are we seeing here? What is this incredible So we're trying tradition? to carry on this special art form, which is in Florence since the Renaissance. So it was handed down by Father Tuchon in workshops in town. And that's where my father and our father started when he was a child. So he was 13 years old and uh, kids could try and learn the art, uh, trying to steal with eyes from their masters. And that's how he started. Little by little, he could have some apprentices. He could, he was very lucky because my brother is very talented. Uh, we can show the different phases of the work, starting from the research of the stone. We can see some of the of the stones used. We import some stones from countries around the world. We import from Chile, Afghanistan. Lapis is one of the most known, or malachite. And we also go on local mountains. And that's the one of the most important and interesting parts of our uh, work. We go, we personally go on the mountains and find the stones that we need on the, on the path where you are walking. And from outside there, the stones. You have to know what it's going to be when you cut the stone. Sometimes you can find something like that, uh, but the edge is just great. So the experience and the talent will tell them how to cut the stones and what you can find. So what is important for us is color. So the shadings that we can find and the hardness. We use a medium hardness in the most scale, which is the scale of the hardnesses of the stones. You can see the beauty of these shadings. This color will be used to create the shadings in our stone paintings. Mm -hmm. Exactly, final. because this is like, you know, painting with stones, exactly. which is uh, much the more complex. The final result <laughs> is a painting. Yes. So most of people who don't know the technique, they think they are painted probably on stones. And that's why we have the uh, doors open to everybody who wants to come in and discover this special art, because it's interesting to see the process, otherwise it's hard to, to understand, no? So what my brother is now making is um, a special uh, design and commission because one of our clients asked to have a monarch butterfly. 
which is the symbol of his country. And uh, so we uh, decided what was the best um, design because my brother and my father, they're very good in drawing, so they can sketch out any design. And from the sketch, which is usually on sticky paper, uh, we can divide the sketch into many different templates. These templates will be put on the stone in the position that the artist decides is the best one to get the right shading and depth at the end of the scene. That's the stone which was used for the butterfly. It's a special stone which comes from Philippines. So he's now going to choose for the green because the background of these uh, mosaic, because it's, it's mosaic, it's made out of stones, yes. it's many different pieces of stones. So he's going to choose because it looks great, it looks exactly more or less the same color, but he knows what it's going to be when it's polished mm -hmm. and put together with the other stones. So he's going to choose the perfect color spot. That's why this part of all the process is called macchiatura. Macchia is the spot. These are the other yes. green, which wow, are already been chosen. Yeah. So this uh, mosaic was made with many different pieces of stones. Okay, they're here divided. But how can we get a perfect joint on yeah. the front side? No spaces different mm -hmm. from any other kind of mosaic. You have to see the back. Wow. So they're glued from the back and you mm -hmm. don't see any joints on the front side. So how can we get this effect? We have to cut the pieces one by one by hand. Mm -hmm. Then I'll show you the cutting tool. Yes. And we cut them on an angle. Cutting them, them beveling the pieces will permit us to find the perfect space yeah. for the glue between yeah. two pieces. Yeah. That's the technique. So the front side will always be flat and perfectly smooth. Mm -hmm. And the back side will have enough space for the glue. The glue is bees, wax and resin, which is also made um, in our workshop because nobody can invent new tools for very few artists left. We can talk about five people left in the world who still do this wow. type yeah. of yeah. art form. Yeah. All right, so later we'll see the cutting of the stone and we'll see how Leonardo is proceeding with his work. Grazie. Ciao. Here we are, back in the kitchen with Silvia. What are we preparing next, dear Silvia? Next, we are preparing panzanella. Mm -hmm. You can call it um, a bread salad. Mm -hmm. And you have to go back to the old times. Yes. When people were baking bread once in a week. And it was a huge bread loaf, which yes. had to last for the whole week. Of course, after two or three days, the bread was stale. Yeah. So you had to recycle it. Yeah. And according to the different seasons, people develop different recipes. So we are now in summer. It's a wonderful summer day. Mm -hmm. We have our state bread. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can't dress it like it is because it is too hard. So you have water, a little bit of vinegar, red vinegar, red wine vinegar. Open up. And of course, the quantity of the vinegar depends on your taste. I like it a little bit sour. And you pour it on the bread. Of course, the bread will need some time to soak the liquid in, so you can prepare it beforehand and while uh, the bread is getting soft you use onions this is a special variety which comes from Certaldo is very close by here mm -hmm. these are red onions which are very very sweet and they don't leave you mm. a bad smell and a bad taste in your mouth they are very fresh okay. 
Okay, you have the fresh onions and you have this kind of tomato, which is a Florentine tomato. Mm -hmm. We call it costoluto. Costa is just because it builds these kind of quarters mm -hmm. and you can cut it in the right shape and right size. So you slice the onions, you prepare the tomatoes. Once the bread is completely soft, you mix everything together. Of course, you need a wonderful olive oil, salt and pepper. And this is the plain version, yes. very simple one with basil leaves of on course. top. So this is the result of the bread, of the stale bread um, soaked in water and vinegar. You have your onions, tomatoes here. You see very roughly cut and mix. So here we are. This is the base and this is a vegetarian dish because you don't have anything. It's a very plain It's bread. vegan, actually, yeah. So it's... it's onions and tomatoes. Now, you want to make it richer, you have feta cheese if you want to go Greek, mm -hmm. or if you want to keep it Italian, just use pecorino cheese, a very soft one, a yes. young one. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be too invasive. And then you can use tuna fish, mm -hmm. again, good quality, and the rest because you need to give some flavor. Mm -hmm. This is a very plain bread. You have the fresh basil. And I know, for example, since this is a summer dish, it is. many, for example, add cucumber exactly, on it. Exactly, because no? they Which are is... fresh and in season. Yeah. So you can actually, you know, customize a little bit according to your taste. But this is the authentic and genuine and panzanella we, as we make it. we have lots of vegetarian bread, uh, recipes. Yes. For a simple reason, uh, meat was very expensive. Yeah. And for the farmers in the region, it was a, a treat to have a dish made with meat, mm -hmm. mainly pork meat. So this is what they just dish for our everyday life. Mm -hmm. Of course, you need, again, extra virgin olive oil, and you have to be generous. Yes. You can't be scared. <laughs> Just go. Yeah. And, well, we have different ones. We are going to make a blend, like we made olive oil in Tuscany. And then you press it, and you let it breast for a while, so that all the flavors get mixed together. Mm -hmm. So for, for how long, actually, when you say for a while? Approximately. I would say one hour, you can prepare it in advance and then you let it rest okay. it until you serve it. So you pay. You use plastic wrap mm -hmm. on top and in the fridge because this is very good when it is cold. Yes. So it shouldn't be too warm or room temperature. Yes. From the fridge out. Yes, yeah. It's the perfect summer dish when it's hot. Exactly. Yeah. Mozzarella cheese, this is another addition which you might use, yes. but it has to be very high quality. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. grazie Silvia. Molto bene. <laughs> ciao. Ciao, ciao. Here we are back with Veronica just to continue our miniature that we started. So we were creating the frame you see there in red and pink on gold leaf and now where are we Veronica Allora la cornice tripartita è finita e è stato riportato il disegno the frame with the three colors is almost at the end mm -hmm. and she's actually starting the painting in the center so the support is paper and she's just applying the gold leaf with a special mix uh, on top of that and then she's going to paint.
you just reproduce in wonderful subject. For example, yes. this one, per esempio questo, you see mm -hmm. here? What is it? So this is a detail of a fresco from Palazzo Vecchio. Yes. And we may say uh, yes. that this is one of the device, one of the motto of Cosimo I, Festina Lente. Eh? Mm -hmm. Run, but be prudent. And yeah. this was uh, one of the many tattoos that you may see all over in Palazzo Vecchio. Yeah. Bravissima, Veronica. <laughs> Super brava. È una tecnica uh, che prevede molta precisione ma anche una discreta velocità perché i libri medievali erano miniati tantissimo alcune volte. Uh, it's a very old tradition. It started in monasteries and go back to the 10th century. And so you have to be very quick as uh, she's mixing pigments with the white and the red of the axe. So the uh, combination have to be used in a very quick way. So you have to be very precise and very quick. Sketching, very fine brushes, and then uh, you just work on the uh, idea, the project, and then layers on layers, you create uh, the illumination. Yeah. We are seeing here some of the buildings in the medieval Florence, right? Um, soggetti provenienti dai libri miniati, italiani ma non solo. She's just working on um, medieval details. This one I like a lot, for example, you see? That seems to be in the baptistery in Florence, yes, something exactly. like with yeah. uh, people, merchants, you know, with the very nice hats, they're working and were buildings uh, all around. This is the iris, which is the famous Florentine lily. As yeah. you know, it's something very different from the French fleur de lis. The yeah. Florentines love to say that our has got two pistils. So when the French will die, the Florentines will survive. <laughs> <laughs> so Veronica is here working on her wonderful illuminations and she's presenting us an ancient technique, which is the one that mostly started in monasteries. As you may see, the pigments that she's using are very, very old and are power and uh, very thin that she is mixing with uh, the white or the red of the egg. And almost uh, the names of the pigments come back to the ancient time, a few of these with legendary stories. But we cannot tell you everything. You have to come and we will tell you when you will be here. Okay. Grazie. Oh
The sounds of nature are very relaxing in this very quiet places in our countryside of the Chianti region where we are spending this time together. And here we are again with our friend Leonardo. Ciao, Ciao. Leo. buongiorno. What can we say about this symbol that we see here? Well, this is actually a um, coat of arms, or you can also define that as a crest, uh, the family crest. And this was something very common back in the day because um, it was important to define the property and even define the name of the family so that everybody would have known exactly what family uh, you were talking about. And it was, pardon me if I use a very modern terminology, it was something like putting a logo on uh, something, on a facade in this case. So even people who could not read, they would have known that that famine in particular was living inside this place. And as you can see, um, if you go back to the coat of arms itself, you can also see the symbol. It's very tiny, but I think you can spot that. The symbol of the city of Florence, the yeah. fleur de lis, exactly. the lily flower. It's on the left hand side, top left hand side of the family. That is actually um, Paola Giovanna's great grandmother family. Exactly. So it's exactly. like a, an eight pointed star. And it's a very center. old uh, coat of arms, still on the, the, the oldest, by the way, part of the building. And here to my left, your right hand side, you can see uh, the oldest part of the building that dates back to the uh, 1100s. Yeah, it's the watchtower that we mentioned exactly. at the beginning, yeah. dating back to the 1100s. Okay, grazie. Grazie a Ciao. voi. Ciao, see you later. Ciao. Here we are again with Leonardo and this is the cutting of the stone as anticipated earlier. We are creating a different pieces of stone that will be eventually committed. So this art is called Commesso Fiorentino. Exactly. So what is the word Commesso mean? So to commit in fact is to join, to put mm. together. Mm -hmm. And that's the art of putting the stones together, putting them perfectly together. And before doing that, we have to cut the stones. So what is Leonardo doing here? So this is the cutting tool, which is the fine in some tools. He's using a bow, which is a chestnut bow, and the nylon wire. You see? Yeah. He's cutting around a template, which is on paper. He's perfectly cutting around it. We can see from here that he's cutting on an angle. He's not cutting yes, straight. Correct. Exactly. So that the front side will be a little bit larger than the back side. He's using a chestnut wood and an iron wire, but he's cutting with a braided powder, which is carborundum, together with water. It's an abrasive face, which is quite hard, much harder than the hardness of the sun itself. It's going to... Um, turn the piece mm -hmm. out and he's going to follow the perfect shape. What we have here is one of the finished artworks by Leonardo. These are really amazing, amazing pieces. Huh? Can I show you some of the stones? Sure. He talked about lapis. Yes. And that's a great part of a lapis. Oh, you can see my ring. <laughs> ah yes, exactly. Look at the ring. Made yeah, with we the can same make yeah parts. small yeah, yeah. small jewels, and you can see the green from the Arno. This stone was found around the river, and that it's exactly the color of the river Arno. You can see some lapis, which was uh, found. This is from Chile. Uh, you can find in Afghanistan as well. You can see some of the jaspers. You see the red jaspers. The green hills is a green from the north of um, Italy. So in these stones, you can see 
some very known stones like malachite or mother of pearl. Yeah, yeah. It's local and imported ones. Yeah, exactly. So, Leonardo, tell us something about, I mean, you're great, you're such a talented artist. When I iniziato, when did you start doing? You know, this kind of thing. Da subito, da mm. quando avevo cinque anni, quindi sì, sì. da bambino è nato come un gioco. E quindi avendo la fortuna di vivere in una bottega è chiaro che questi strumenti, questi colori, queste pietre fin da bambino sono state parte della mia vita. Ah. E poi hai avuto l'esempio di ispirazione di tuo padre. Chiaro, la Sarvani. fortuna è proprio ah. quella, nasci già con un maestro davanti, quindi comunque si impari a convivere con l'arte, ah. non tanto a farla o a... E la fortuna è appunto di avere un padre che fa un mestiere come questo, poi l'amore è nato abbastanza spontaneo, nel senso qui la passione o ti travolge o se no non lo fai, magari un mestiere come questo. C'è un, un capolavoro, eh? che è il ponte vecchio, sì, how no. many pieces is that? Abbiamo fatto un lavoro abbastanza importante, nel senso che ci sono quasi 2000 pezzi, due anni di lavoro effettivo e quindi 3200 ore, una cosa del genere. Wow, it's like 3200 hours of work to put together 2000 pieces to create something that you can discover hmm? when you'll go and visit Leonardo and Katia in their atelier. And then, thank you, grazie Leonardo. Grazie. You can see some of his work. Yes. In fact, you see the difference in the style because my father's more for the traditional. You can see yeah. this beautiful traditional art with black background and it's yeah. an inlay. That's what we were talking about. Yeah. You see, this subject is on a black background. This and is something more contemporary. Yes. You can see the beauty of the stone, which is the Labradorite. I don't know if you can see it, which mm -hmm. shines. Yeah. And you see the beauty of that in one stone. You can see the shading and the, the, our artworks are all signed. <laughs> oh, this exactly. This is the the masterpiece I was telling you about. Yeah. This um, is the Ponte Vecchio. It, it's amazing the the realism of this work made in stone. All of this is made with stones. That's yeah. That's Renzo. Renzo. Yes, um, the father, uh, the main uh, master. The so, um, this is our book, which was just published last yes. year. Yeah. It has been a work because we, we don't write books usually. Yeah. <laughs> we, we talk a lot, but yes. not. Yes. You can find the stories of our lives, the stories yes. of our passion and some of the finished uh, works, yeah. but above all, which are the secrets behind of what you see in our yeah. workshop? I, I was really moved at many different points while reading your book. It's Absolutely. something which is emotional. Absolutely. Yeah. Grazie, Katia. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for inviting us to this special, wonderful, incredible place and experience. Okay. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. We are in the very beautiful garden of Il Maceto. You see the amazing countryside of the Chianti area and what can we say about these parts of this borgo here Leonardo? Well buongiorno di nuovo good morning again well as Paola Giovanna just mentioned uh, before um, talking about this ancient tower you can see here to the left which is part of the place of the estate, if I might use the word. Uh, we are in the Chianti area, uh, a beautiful uh, region, even if the word is not uh, technically correct, a beautiful area that extends from the north, uh, from Florence to the south, to Siena. As you can see, gentle rolling hills, vineyards, olive groves, and woods uh, everywhere. Uh, this area is home to perhaps the most famous uh, wine uh, around the world, which does have the same name. Uh, well, uh, we don't have a grape with that name because a lot of people usually think that the name comes 
from a grape, uh, which is called Chianti. It's not exactly like that. Uh, the main grape in this area is Sangiovese. Chianti is simply the name of this region. And uh, according to some uh, quite many sources, it could derive from an ancient Etruscan word meaning water. Uh, the ancient word was, I'll spell it for you, C-L-A-N-T, meaning source of water. And we can uh, tell the reason why, because if you look around us, you can see this area, even if we are in summer in June, it's really green. Uh, I also would like to add a few uh, things about uh, the military uh, use of this tower back in the day because I just would like to, you to know that uh, way before Italy became a nation, uh, this area was fought over uh, in between Florence and Siena. And we have to imagine a lot of fightings and uh, wars going on back and forth till Florence conquered this area and created a military league that was set up in 1384, which basically was over there where you see that line. Maybe you can't see there's a village whose name is Pansano uh, there and another village behind me whose name is Radda. Uh, so this was the border between the two republic, uh, republics until, uh, as Paolo Giovanna before mentioned, uh, Siena fell to Florence in 1555. One of the symbols of this great area is the black rooster. You can see on one of the bottles of the wine that is produced here at the estate of Paola Giovanna. The black rooster has been the symbol of this area since the very beginning. I'm speaking about the medieval times. And it's also been pictured in one of the main landmarks in the city of Florence, that's the old palace. I also would like to add something else. Let me put this down. And um, because I have this lovely book that uh, came out a few years ago, written by a local artist, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, as you can see, uh, I'll translate that for you because it's in Italian. It says Michelangelo Schianti. What does it mean? I think very few people know that Michelangelo, well, besides being an artist, a sculptor, a painter, a genius of the Renaissance, was also interested, like a modern traveler, we could say, in this beautiful land, in this beautiful part of Tuscany. And in this book, we actually read that in 1549, he did ask his nephew, Leonardo, to take care of an important purchase. Basically, the territory around the estate of Paolo Giovanna, where I am now, uh, belonged to the Buonarroti family. And apparently, it was within the family, part of the family possession, for a very long time. So, I just want to show you what happened to our dough, which has been resting. Yes, uh, look at, at that. Room temperature. What happens? So it yeah. rises. Yeah. It yeah. rises, it's full of air. If you do this, it loses wow. consistency. Mm -hmm. You can just work it. Not too much, because otherwise you are going to lose the consistency of the dough. And if you have time, you put it back for another 30 minutes into the oven before you spread it and you bake it. Benissimo. This is the second rising of our dough. It's perfect. What we are going to do now is now we do this so that you start with a square. So 
So, if you are in Naples, mm -hmm. pizza makers are going to use their hands to stretch it. The same level. Olive oil on the pan. Of course, I'm showing you the technique mm -hmm. if you are baking pizza in your oven. Mm -hmm. And here we are. So what we have here is Datterini, which uses small tomatoes. They are very sweet and they are right in season. Now, a little bit of salt, because you remember we were not using salt in our dough. And then, here we are. Okay. Some more extra virgin olive oil. Be generous. Okay. You might wonder why I'm not using mozzarella cheese, mm -hmm. which I have already here. But if I place it now on the pizza, the mozzarella cheese will release a lot of humidity. Mm -hmm. And my dough won't bake mm -hmm. correctly. So it goes into the oven like this. When the dough is done, Yes. I'm just going to add the mozzarella cheese and back again for five minutes so that the mozzarella cheese melts and then basically leaves on top. Nothing else. Here. It's 220, which in Fahrenheit would be about 440 for about 20 minutes. Then back from the oven. Mozzarella cheese on top and again five minutes. And All right. Okay. Great. Grazie. Yeah. And buon appetito. So here we are again with Leonardo Alessi, my dear friend and Buongiorno. expert tour leader and tour guide here in Tuscany. And together with him, we have, we have another great friend of mine. I've known her for many, many, many years now. Yes, and she's uh, one of the greatest <laughs> stars in Florence. She's an <laughs> art historian. And I just uh, leave you to their great words. Well, uh, buongiorno again, my friends. Uh, joining me now is Lucia Montuski, as Giacomo buongiorno. said, also a very good friend of mine. And I just would like you, Lucia, to say a little bit more, to tell us a little bit more about Michelangelo. Since I briefly mentioned that Michelangelo's family had uh, possessions in this area, so I just would like you to tell us something new about Michelangelo as an artist. Of course, it's my pleasure. We love him. In his long life, he lived 89 years. Michelangelo really was a fabulous a sculptor, and we know. But you gave me two great connections. As uh, One is uh, Palazzo Vecchio, the old palace in Florence. Uh, you just mentioned the black rooster up on the top of the wooden ceiling of the city hall in Florence, where the Medici lived as Grand Dukes of Tuscany. But in that very special room that was the first uh, hall in Florence, uh, Michelangelo and Leonardo were commissioned to work on two fabulous frescoes uh, about two battles. And Michelangelo probably 
around 1505, which was the period in which Florence was leaving the golden age because uh, Raphael was in town. Leonardo da Vinci just completed the famous Mona Lisa. And uh, we know that Michelangelo was working probably on uh, the only one painting that he did in his life. I'm not mentioning frescoes. I'm not talking about statues. Yes. I'm talking about a painting that we know is inside the Uffizi Gallery, the Tondo exactly. Doni. And uh, during this special time, he was probably sketching and working on this fabulous fresco of the Battaglia di Cascina, the, Ca the Cascina battle. We have just some sketches about that. And into Palazzo della Signoria, we also have a marvelous unfinished statue, which is the victory. But we want to mention Michelangelo connected to this place. Michelangelo was uh, a lover of life. Uh, he lived in every life. Sense. In yes. every sense. Yes. Uh, do you uh, agree? I do agree. So he really spent his life with no regrets. Huh? He spent his life enjoying what? I, I would say to the fullest. Right. Uh, and so, as we are here, immersed in this beautiful green, uh, no doubt that as he saw this place, he felt in love. And he trusted his nephew, yep. Leonardo, yep. asking him to buy uh, this place that was, in his mind, one of the things that he had to do. So, the Buonarroti place, the Buonarroti memory, the Buonarroti life is still here in this green area where actually we are. So, Lucia, we've been talking about Michelangelo. What can we say more about this great artist we have here in Tuscany? Well, Michelangelo is the name, is one of the most important artists that we had. If you don't come to Florence, you cannot discover the fabulous life that he had. Seven masterpieces in the Academy of the Fine Arts. And uh, uh, the Casa Buonarroti, where you can see his little hands when he was only 14 years old, can you believe? And he was working on this splendid bas relief. And then it, uh, the Bardiello Museum. So coming to Florence, and here you can discover some of the places that I just mentioned. The Tower of the Bardiello, the ancient Badia Fiorentina. This is the city hall where you may see the black rooster that uh, Leonardo just mentioned. But mostly you may see one of the most important icon of Florence. If not the most important. Of uh, course. This amazing cupola that Brunelleschi uh, created uh, starting 1420 eventually. You should know that this amazing church that you see here was started by the end of the 1200 when Florence was the most powerful and wealthiest city in the area. Yeah. And uh, competing with Siena. So in Siena they had a bigger church and therefore in Florence they decided to make their church bigger. They started a church, to cut a long story short, by the 1370s, 70 years later, the church structure was completed, but they had quite a, a, an important issue at that point because above the main altar there was a huge hall that was 46 meters diameter and nobody had any clue on how to complete that It was a big structure. problem. It was a very big problem. <laughs> Florentines started praying God, asking for a miracle. You know how we are here. We start things and um, we trust that God at some point will intervene and find a solution for it. 1370s, no solution. Brunelleschi had not, was not born yet at that time. It took 50 years before God sent the solution uh, through the hands and the genius of Brunelleschi. Uh, he started this dome in 1420. It took him 16 years to complete this amazing structure with cheese. To date, still the largest masonry dome ever built. It, 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 its weight is more than 30,000 tons. It, it, it's built using 4 million bricks. It's yeah. just something incredible. In 1436, it was completed only 16 years to achieve this incredible masterpiece. There would be much more we could say, we could wow. say about it, but... No, I'm sure that you really were complete in your explanation. Thank you for telling that, because uh, Florence is the city of genius. Florence is the city of uh, the greatest artist, and the Dome by Brunelleschi is one of the best icons that we have. Ecco la sposa che va
Ciao. By now, you get my point. We are taking you to some of the greatest places we have here in Tuscany. We were just a few moments ago in the Chianti region, south of Florence, and now we teleported ourselves to the northern part of Florence on the hills that define the northern border of Tuscany. And this is where we are going to discover another amazing place. It's a medieval castle. And this is where we are going to meet some of our great friends. Andiamo! Buongiorno, ok, of course, our friends, Leonardo and Lucia. So, wow, this is a great place here. Well, we are in a very uh, well beautiful setting, uh, castle. It's one of the many castles we have in Tuscany. Uh, sometimes people don't really uh, realize that even a region like Tuscany does have a lot of castles because sometimes we think about other areas, other countries. Well, this place dates back to, well, a long time ago, 11th, 10th century. Uh, at least the most important part that you have seen coming in from the outside. Uh, the name of this place is, I'll say that in Italian first, Castello del Trebbio. Well, Castello means castle. Trebbio is a very interesting word because it comes from the Latin word trivium, meaning three roads getting together, um, connecting. And that is, by the way, the same uh, origin that it's at the base of the Trevi Fountain in Rome, just to tell you something else. Yeah. Um, the Trebbio Castle has a very long history and uh, a very interesting one, as uh, Lucia here knows. Well, we know. <laughs> <laughs> we are inside of this splendid castle and the courtyard, as usual, uh, where you may see this beautiful pillars and capitals, gray and white, mm -hmm. which remind us immediately the fantastic modular architecture introduced by Filippo Brunelleschi exactly. and uh, the Florentine style that make us understand that probably a family that knew Florence pretty well probably was living here. Because if you look right on the top of this splendid Renaissance door, you may see one of the coat of arm of the Pazzi family, authentic, that we can still see. Because due to the conspiracy, and when we say Pazzi and Medici, all of us, we think about Immediately. Uh, that uh, a fact uh, and this kind of very fight, strong connection uh, that yeah. uh, there was. Uh, when uh, during the night, the Saturday night before Easter, the brother of Lorenzo il Magnifico Giuliano was assassinated. Uh, it was 1478 in the cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore, St. Mary of the Flower Cathedral in Florence. So, because of that reason, all the Pazzi coat of arm were completely destroyed. That's why this is something very special and seems to be 
authentic. Uh, we are almost sure that it's one of the last quote one that we can see. Um, a few uh, love to say that according to a legend, yes. that uh, is by Donatello. When we think about the Medici family and we think about Brunelleschi and Donatello, we know how much the family was connected with. And uh, we were just talking, Leonardo, before that probably you are reminding, would you like to tell that about? Well, uh, the, the current owner, by the way, who lives in the castle, uh, they do have a kind of documentation according to which, um, taking over from what Lucia just said, the coat of arms might have been sculpted by Donatello or the school of Donatello. And there's another very nice legend uh, that goes like this. Uh, right after the conspiracy, uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent might have come here in this place. We don't exactly know whether that is true or not. Might have come here in this place and looking up at the coat of arms behind us, uh, it would have recognized the hand of a great artist. So that is the reason why uh, the, the, the coat of arms uh, was not destroyed. But um, one thing is sure that uh, in this place we can actually feel the history. We right. can actually feel yeah. the beauty of the place and why I think we should proceed and go to the cellar. What do you think? Hot. I'm drinking a little wine. Alright, <laughs> let's go underground then. And Go on the ground and let's see what this castle is hiding for us. Hmm. Wow. <sighs> the smell is already amazing. Let's see what we have here. All right. Well, oh, you Leo, found me. You're here again. Uh, I, am. I found you everywhere. What's going on here? What is this place here? Oh, and Lucia is also here. Yes. Hey, all right, I you're bringing always, in wine. I am always ready for a good glass of good wine. Oh, Hello. yes, and they have an excellent wine and here. they do. Very, very good. Where are we? Well, we are, as you can guess and tell, we are in the 900 years old uh, wine cellars of the castle, wow. Castello del Trebbio. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the big barrels here, where they're uh, aging, I was reading before you came, uh, they're basically aging the uh, 2019 uh, wine, but I can see also 2013, so different actually vintages. As far as we know, uh, this part of the castle was used back in the day as the uh, dungeons uh, before being converted into the wine cellar. You can also see way above the uh, barrels, you can yes. see a very strange device. Uh, it looks like a bottle, uh, and in fact it is a bottle, actually two, which have been cut and uh, put one on top of the other. This uh, is a great device that Leonardo da Vinci, the great Leonardo da Vinci, uh, did invent. And this basically uh, stops the air from getting into the barrel, preserving the wine. You know that air is very bad for mm -hmm. wine. And so this leads us to talk a little bit about maybe Leonardo, Why or the painter, Why but not? also the well, scientist. Of course, he was the science man interested about life. He was a man that dedicated his yes. life, curious uh, as uh, a good genius uh, yeah. should be. And when we talk about Leonardo, we think about his sketches. And I love to remind uh, how much uh, he was uh, soft uh, in his sketches. And he started when he was uh, 13 years old. And in his very, uh, life, yeah. long uh, enough for the time, 67 years old he died. He was the creator of new ideas. One of the things that I want to remind about Leonardo is that he studied the movement of the face, what we call physiognomica. 
So in this place, so you know, in a castle, thinking about also fortification that yes. Leonardo da Vinci, you know, designed at the time. But in this place where we really hope you will come and feel the joy and feel happiness, uh, maybe uh, and drink with the wine. a good glass of wine <laughs> to make us laugh and be happy, we'd love to remind Leonardo da Vinci yes. uh, with uh, the family, uh, the Pazzi family, with the magic family in Florence uh, with a fantastic culture that you can breathe uh, in every place with the beauty of the country. Thank you. So, in this uh, wonderful place, uh, I really need to thank you, Paola Giovanna, yeah, yeah. for the hospitality. Because when you come in a place like this, you feel the beauty of Tuscany. And yes. this is what we love to feel. And we just need to add that you can come here for your holidays. You can come here to spend a few days. But this location, this ancient medieval Borgo, oh, yes, uh, where your family yes. still live, can be rent for exclusive event for something very special like weddings. Yes, of course. Of course. We already had last year um, a girl. Uh, our friend from California, and they came here to, to celebrate to their celebrate. wedding. Yes. So they can come with a family, they can renovate their promises, and this will be really forever. <laughs> forever. So we, we hope so. <laughs> we hope so. Yeah. So thank you very much, you and you welcome. can see the elegance uh, and uh, the beauty of uh, the Tuscan ladies. Giacomo, I prepared a surprise for you. Wow. I baked pistotti. Uh -huh. This is the Italian recipe with almonds and anise seeds because this is the original recipe here in Tuscany. Mm -hmm. This will be your dessert. The and these are the very famous cantucci or cantuccini, how we call it here. Exactly. And these are a very plain dessert. Mm -hmm. You don't have a lot of ingredients mm -hmm. and you bake them twice. Twice. In order to extract the humidity so that they can keep longer. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why we serve them with wine as a dessert. Yeah. Never with coffee, with a sweet wine of Vin Santo, yeah. which is made here. Yeah. So next, next time, time yeah, you'll teach us how to make this and how we eat it. Grazie exactly. Silvia. Ciao, ciao. So, here we are by this very old oven. This is from 1702. We are about to prepare our Schiacciata or focaccia. Uh, we can use both words and Federica here is going to show us how to proceed with it. I'm working as a sous chef here. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, that's a... So this kind of wood oven that you just saw was well, basically everywhere in all these... It was these. everywhere because you were baking bread. Yes. At home, and there yeah. was no bread. Shop and as you said, and as my mother used to tell, tell me, uh, they would bake bread like once a week. Exactly. And, and to yeah. last 
for at least one week. And this yes. is the way why, you know, the reason why we developed so many recipes with bread. If yeah. you were rich, you were adding some more ingredients. Otherwise, mm -hmm. a little bit of vegetables, yes. tomatoes, or onions. Exactly, onions, a lot of and that, and yes. And yeah. 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 And you see here the outcome of our great work. See the schiacciata and this great toppings that you can customize, as we said earlier, with different kinds of ingredients that you can add eventually in a second moment. Liviamo, liviamo nel lieti calici che la bellezza infiora e la fuggevol, fuggevol ora si nebria voluta liviamo i dolci fremiti che suscita l'amore poiché quell'occhio al cuore ogni possente va li diamo amore amore fra i calici più caldi ma ci avrà That's it. Grazie.
we are here again admiring this very beautiful countryside in the Chianti region. Now, right next to this estate in Masito in Chianti, where we are now, something very special happened back in time less than a century ago, in the 1930s specifically. Can you tell us something more, Leonardo? Yes, with pleasure. Buongiorno. Um, I do have something in my, uh, in my hands um, that I'm going to show you. And it says, I'll translate that for you from Italian, a beacon of light before the darkness. And it's a very interesting research that Paolo Giovanna did um, a few years ago, uh, together with another friend. Um, potresti raccontarci qualcosa di più preciso, Paola, su questa interessantissima ricerca che, um, come tu mi hai detto, è stata anche presentata in Israele? In Israele. Molto volentieri, perché è un ricordo che vorrei non, non si perdesse, perché è stato un momento veramente drammatico, e, eh, cioè che ha preceduto un momento veramente drammatico e per tanti giovani eh, sionisti è stato anche un momento di eh, fuga da, già da, un brutto, da una brutta situazione in Germania. Questa è la ricerca è, è avvenuta negli anni per gli anni 1934-38 negli archivi di Siena e in Israele e il, il risultato è quello che vedete, è una ricerca storica su un periodo sionista di giovani ebrei che volevano andare nell'allora Palestina per fondare i kibbutzim. Loro venivano in Italia per trovare una situazione ehm, pedologicamente la più simile a quella che avrebbero trovato in, in Medio Oriente e il Chianti di quei tempi era la, il posto più sassoso, arido, non dobbiamo guardare il Chianti di oggi certo. dove le coltivazioni sono intensive, dove tutto è verde, dove tutto è molto rilassante negli anni 30 il Chianti era povero di acqua mm -hmm. quindi siccitoso al massimo sassoso perché ancora non era stato eh, pulito diciamo da tutte certo. le rocce che... certo. infatti il vino Chianti è buono perché nasce sulla roccia esatto <ride> Questi ragazzi avrebbero qui trovato la stessa situazione che poi in realtà hanno trovato andando in Palestina. Dico Palestina perché come si sa lo Stato di Israele è dal 1948 che esiste. Nel 1934-38 esisteva la Palestina controllata dalla, dalla Gran Bretagna. Era la Gran Bretagna. Questi ragazzi venivano dalla Germania con un'organizzazione tedesca sionista che li mandava qui, Bahad, e eh, imparavano a coltivare la terra. La comunità fiorentina, ebraica fiorentina, aveva affittato per loro una villa, la villa di Ricavo, mm -hmm. dove la fattoria tenuta da sette famiglie contadine si accollava sempre due, tre di questi giovani che dovevano imparare a lavorare la terra. Quindi è stata un'esperienza importantissima, è stata un formativa, oltre che umana. Umana e importantissima, prefiguro. lavorativa, certo. perché loro hanno imparato a coltivare vite, olivo, grano. Erano ragazzi di famiglie borghesi, erano studenti, c'erano medici, c'erano figli di commercianti, 
c'erano eh, un dentista per esempio io ho trovato un dentista che era venuto addirittura con tutta la sua attrezzatura e che come hanno detto qui nel, nella zona ha rimesso la bocca a mezza, cast- mezza castellina poi chiaramente ha dovuto smettere di fare il dentista sì. perché i dentisti del luogo si sono risentiti sì. perché questo lavorava gratuitamente sì. e portava via lavoro sì. ma l'esperienza che loro hanno fatto in questa zona è stata determinante per, la, la, per, per esempio la fondazione del kibbutz di Berotti Zak Berotti Zak è stato fondato da questi ragazzi Sarebbe anche che tu menzionassi eh, il tuo amico, nonché collaboratore, sì, sì, eh, sì. che con te ha scritto questa bellissima sì, ricerca. Anche sì. se ricerca mi sembra un po' riduttivo da un punto di vista personale, perché eh, questo per me è un libro. Ed è, un, è un libro fotografico. È un libro fotografico, ecco, però ricordo... ricchissimo di informazioni e il lavoro sì. svolto è stato enorme. 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 Enorme perché eh, prima di tutto tu hai detto una cosa giustissima, voglio ricordare e ringraziare Vittorio Luzzatti che purtroppo non c'è più ma che sicuramente in questo momento mi sente, che essendo italiano, parlando perfettamente italiano perché era un toscano di Pisa e essendo vivendo in Israele, ha avuto accesso a tutti gli archivi israeliani, cosa che per me sarebbe stata estremamente difficile avere, certo. mentre io ho avuto accesso agli archivi italiani. Uh-huh. Io sono una storica, sono archivista, quindi per me è stato abbastanza, tra virgolette, facile arrivare al, all'archivio. È stato difficilissimo trovare il fondo dove i documenti erano conservati perché ha tutto pensato tranne al fondo della polizia Mm. perché questi ragazzi erano tutti schedati e tutti controllati perché purtroppo in Italia c'era già il periodo storico che ben conosciamo conosciamo, però francamente sono stati trattati fino al 38 bene sono stati accolti bene anche perché Mussolini sperava con questo di potersi fare il nido in, mm. in, in, in Palestina, cosa che poi chiaramente è cambiata Le storicamente, sono, sono andate in maniera diversa, come sappiamo. purtroppo sì. Mm. E, comunque questi ragazzi hanno avuto la possibilità, come dicevamo, di imparare, hanno avuto la possibilità di vivere in Italia e di allontanarsi tranquillamente dall'Italia partendo poi dal porto di Trieste per la Palestina, mm-hmm. imbarcarsi lì. L'unica cosa che hanno avuto come difficoltà reale è stato l'imbarco, perché i, i permessi per l'ingresso in, Isra- in Palestina dovevano essere dati dalla Gran Bretagna che li dava con il contagocce. In sulla guerra ce l'hai fatto il nido. Vorrei 
chiederti un'ultima cosa. Eh, questa ricerca poi è stata presentata in Israele e tu hai avuto l'occasione sì. di recarti in Israele sì. e immagino anche, eh, presumo l'accoglienza se posso utilizzare questo termine. L'accoglienza è stata eh, fraterna. Eh, ho visto persone che sono venute incontro a me abbracciandomi, ringraziandomi perché eh, molti erano quelli che l'hanno vissuta che l'avevano vissuta la, la, molti, alcuni molti invece erano i giovani di, di queste famiglie che erano all'oscuro di questa mm. esperienza mm. e quindi hanno scoperto dei momenti di vita dei loro familiari, dei loro genitori dei loro zii io ho una lettera qui di una ragazza che mi è venuta incontro piangente alla sede dell'istituto italiano di cultura in, in AIFA e mi è venuta incontro abbracciandomi e, thank you Paola thank you Paola, piangendo io non capivo perché thank you, thank you mm -hmm e l'ho saputo tornando in Italia perché mi è arrivata una mail in cui questa ragazza mi dice che lei non sapeva niente di questo e che vedendo il mio lavoro, il nostro lavoro, ha trovato il nome dello zio fra la lista dei 200 esatto, ragazzi esatto perché c'è su questo documento appunto una lista dei 200, sì. delle 200 persone poi che sono state in qualche sì, modo infatti. parte di questa esperienza 200 persone provenienti da tutte le parti dell'Europa nel periodo teleriano sì. quindi all'inizio vediamo che sono quelli molto sono i tedeschi che vengono via e poi via via che il nazismo si espande vediamo polacchi, cecoslovacchi, austriaci, ungheresi, vediamo tutto il mondo, la parte d'Europa che era poi caduta sotto il nazismo e vediamo giovani che tentano questa, anche questa strada forse per salvarsi. Un raggio di sole prima delle tenebre, eh, grazie davvero Paolo Giovanni grazie per questo voi. tuo intervento, contributo e per aver scritto questo bellissimo libro fotografico e per la memoria, per che la è memoria. la cosa più importante. Per la memoria soprattutto e questa è la famosa lettera di cui ci parlavi. Vi parlavo. Grazie mille. Grazie a voi.